Thank you for joining us. I'm Chris Woods, Director of the Oriental Institute. I'd like to welcome you to this, our second online members lecture. As we adapt to the new reality of working remotely and social distancing, the OI is continuing to produce stimulating content for you through our YouTube channel. I'd like to extend special thanks to our members without whose support this program would not be possible. And for those of you who are not members, we certainly hope that you will consider supporting us. It's my privilege to introduce our speaker, my colleague, Ray Johnson. Ray is Research Associate Professor in the OI and the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at the University of Chicago. Since 1997, Ray has been Director of the OI's Epigraphic Survey, based in Luxor, Egypt, which just completed its 96th field season last spring. Ray joined the staff of the Epigraphic Survey in 1979 as Epigraphic Draftsman, in which capacity he helped document the opit reliefs of Tutankhamun in the Great Colonnade Court of Luxor Temple and began the Luxor Temple Fragment Project. He served as senior artist from 1982, became assistant director in 1995, before being promoted to the directorship of the Epigraphic Survey. Ray is the longest serving Epigraphic Survey staff member in its history. Ray received his doctorate in Egyptian archaeology from the University of Chicago in 1992, and he has participated in excavations at the site of Fort William Henry in colonial Permaquid, Maine, at Shogamish, Iran, at Kusir el Kadim on the Red Sea coast of Egypt, and at Carthage, Tunisia. Ray also serves on the steering committee of the Akhenaten Museum in Minya, Egypt and currently directs the Amarna Talatat project. Ray will be speaking about his recent research and the work of the epigraphic survey in his presentation, Medinet Habu and Tel El Amarna, Tales of Blocks and Towers. I hope you will enjoy this online members lecture. Good evening, my name is Ray Johnson. I'm the director of the epigraphic survey, Oriental Institute, University of Chicago, based at Chicago House in Luxor. I'm also a research associate professor of the Oriental Institute and the University of Chicago. It is my great pleasure to be with you remotely this evening as part of the Oriental Institute member lecture series. And I'm looking forward very much to sharing with you some of our current work activities in Luxor. We're going to start, first part of the lecture will focus on material that we have been um, processing and documenting in the western part of the Medina Tabu complex. Now, the epigraphic survey was founded in 1924 to continue the systematic scientific documentation of the ancient remains that fill Luxor. It's an absolutely incredible antiquity site. And the idea is to document and publish all this material, get it out into the world. The Medinet Habu precinct, the mortuary complex of Ramses III, had been partially excavated in the 19th century, but not finished. And the University of Chicago contracted with German archaeologist and architect Uwe Holscher between 1927 and 1933 to finish the excavation of Medinet Habu, study the architecture, uh, document it and publish all of his data. He was also extremely good at synthesizing and he was very, very interested in the history and the development of the complex. Now, one of the things that he realized and had been known for a while is that uh, the mortuary temple of Ramses III was a two-phase structure. The um, ground plan on the left shows the mortuary temple in the center, the stone structure, surrounded by mud brick enclosure wall, storage facilities, administrative areas, and that fundamentally was the mortuary temple, uh, very, very similar to the mortuary temple of Ramses II just down the road. In fact, Ramses III seems to have copied that almost verbatim. Late in Ramses III's reign, or sometime around his jubilee in year 30, the entire mortuary temple precinct was surrounded with a massive new enclosure wall that was pierced with two stone high gates at the east and the western ends. So the complex was made absolutely enormous, but the core of it was the mortuary temple itself. Here's what the eastern entry gate, the eastern high gate, looks like today. There's an archival photograph in the upper left. 
the stone gateway entrance, what we refer to as the Eastern High Gate, is over 20 meters in height, and it survives to its original height at the back, which is over 65 feet tall. But what you're looking at is actually, the sandstone is actually a veneer over a mud brick core. So the gate itself, which was incredibly massive, uh, was actually mostly mud brick with a stone facing. So in the middle, we're looking at the front of the gate. In the uh, far right, we're looking at the back of the gate. You have to imagine the back gate on the right was flanked by two mud brick towers equal in size and the same height. You also have to imagine that the enclosure wall that these gates pierced was the same height as the gate, or a little bit shorter, I think about 18 meters or so, about 60 feet. And here's, if you look in the middle, a lower um, a plan you can see in white is the stone veneer, and then the brick is indicated on either side. And these are uh, all drawings of Uvo Holscher, uh, who was an incredibly gifted draftsman. And this is his reconstruction of what the complex looked like in the time of Ramses III when it was fully functioning. Pretty impressive. Now the decoration, the carved decoration on the outside of the uh, fortified gateway is what you'd expect. It's uh, military scenes or symbolic scenes that show the king vanquishing his enemies in the presence of the gods. And it's the sort of decoration that you find on the outside of pylons decoration you would expect to find uh, protecting sacred precinct beyond. So this is, and then there are offering scenes as well to the god Amun and various gods of the Theban pantheon. The decoration on the inside of the stone towers is shockingly different. What is preserved are scenes showing the king relaxing in a family setting, a domestic setting surrounded by his children and his household. There are no names, but it's pretty clearly, these are scenes from a residence. It's pretty clear based on the decoration inside the high gates that this was the king's residence when he was in Luxor. Uh, and it's like a high rise palace. It was at least three stories tall. Most of the rooms would have been in the mud brick um, sections of the, uh, of the gateway. But luckily for us, the stone sections were carved as well. And uh, there is quite a bit of paint that survives on the undersides of doorways and windows. So we're dealing with a, what looks like a fortification on the outside and a domestic uh, palace setting on the inside. There was no hint until 1933 that a second gate existed in the complex. And it is a great irony that um, uh, Holscher built a sort of rest house, a field house, at the very back of the complex, right on top of the ruins of the second gate, not knowing it was there. It was completely covered up. He was work doing excavation in the area. The plan was they would be finishing work in 1933, and that would be it. They took down the field house and they found the remains of the gate below it, much to everyone's surprise. And they'd already, they had run out of time, so they weren't actually able to finish. But Holscher did enough work to establish the ground plan of the gate. It had been destroyed and partly quarried uh, in antiquity. The gate seems to have been demolished, or at least the beginning, was, the beginning of the demolition happened at the end of Dynasty 20 during a period of civil unrest in Egypt. So there was very, there was very little of the gate that survived, but the footprint was there, the foundation trenches. And once again, the gate was made of a stone veneer against a mud brick core that was really quite massive, and it turns out to be even broader than uh, the eastern high gate. So not exactly the same, the same plan, very similar, but actually a larger entryway into the complex from the back. Holscher wasn't able to finish, and so if he had been able, if, if the Oriental Institute had been able to raise more money, he might have been able to continue for another year or two, but it never happened. He never came back, and this is how he left the site, and this is how we inherit it today. Scattered blocks, there are blocks scattered around, um, but not enough to actually establish, not enough to actually rebuild the entire gate. There's an incredible amount of material missing. 
Now, we have been wanting to address this rather large loose end for many, many years. And five years ago, we received a very generous grant from USAID Egypt to develop the area around the Medina Tabu Mortuary Temple um, for uh, tourism, for visitors to make the air, to develop the area so that it was more accessible and uh, safe for uh, visitors who wanted to see more of the complex. And as you can see, the only part of the gate that actually survived is part of the glacis, which is in the, the left-hand photograph at the back. That's the only part of the gate, the stone part of the gate that's still in situ. Um, but the tumbled stones had never been properly cataloged. So um, we started this project about five years ago with this grant from USAID. And the project director is Jen, Dr. Jen Kimpton, one of our, the, the epigraphic surveys uh, pigraphers. And she has um, organized the documentation, the um, recording, the analysis, of all the fragmentary material of the of the destroyed high gate, uh, but of course this is a collaborative effort. Everything starts with documentation, but because of the nature of the material and some of the, the massive size of some of the blocks and their bad condition, we've also had to work with conservator Lutfi Hassan, our main conservator at La Medina Tabu and master mason Frank Helmholtz, <clears throat> whose stone crew not only moves stones, but also uh, reassembles them. And as part of our USAID funded uh, program at, at Medina Tabu, he has been, he and his team have been restoring a whole series of paved walkways from the time of Ramses III around the temple that are now allow, is allowing easy and easier and safe access uh, to the back parts of the temple including this one. And on the, in the picture on the right, Jen is uh, explaining our work to USAID mission director Sherry Carlin. This is back in 2016. And uh, the grant that we have now will, will continue for the next three years. We're enormously grateful that it's allowing us to address this rather interesting site that has just simply not been properly studied or developed yet. Of course, everything starts with documentation, and the documentation team here, uh, a, a rather large one, everything starts with photography. Yarko Kobalecki on the left, our staff photographer. Um, Hilary McDonald, digital photography. Ellie Smith, registrar. Owen Murray, another digital photographer. Assistant director, Brett McLean. Jen Kempton. Our librarian, Annie Ede Helmholtz, who also helps with the West Highgate work. Um, artist Kelly Alberts behind the block here, who uh, is doing most of the drawings of the material with Jen. And then epigrapher uh, Ariel Singer here, who has been doing quite a bit of our digital documentation, including especially the uh, 3D uh, documentation of the material. So this is the core team that has been working on the, the uh, um, cataloging and documenting of the material. Of course, everything starts with a database. Sketches are, are uh, entered. Every fragment gets a number. I believe there are over 1,400 of them now, maybe closer to 1,500, from enormous intact blocks to small fragments. It turns out that um, Holscher, while he wasn't able to process the, the material properly, he did make some observations. He did make some joins that he published in his excavation of Medina Tabu series, including this one, which is a wonderful scene showing the king seated, receiving um, a bouquet from uh, one, of his, one of the female members of his household, and he is offering her a drink. So he published this photograph in 1951, uh, but neglected to publish the sides of the blocks, which add an entirely new dimension to the whole group. It turns out um, this, this scene isn't just a floater. This was a scene that was carved between two open windows in the inside of the tower. 
And what this tells us is that the decorative scheme of the Western Tower was identical to the Eastern Tower, battle scenes on the, on the outside and uh, intimate domestic scenes on the inside, including this one. And in the window emplacements, just like the Eastern Tower, there are very often depictions of stands with baskets of fruit and uh, edible goodies that uh, uh, seems to be standard for the window decoration. Sometimes it's only found in paint. So lots of information in these blocks. Now, in the course of analysis and cataloging, a couple more blocks were found from this particular group that, that uh, Holscher had not noticed. And our drawings now, and this is, uh, these are preliminary drawings done by Kelly Alberts, you can see that the two new blocks down here complete the um, scene of the king seated and then the ground line and then an undecorated dado. Now, what's even more interesting about these blocks is that they're also decorated on the outside. So these are interior scenes, but here on the right, we have uh, elements of the exterior scene. It doesn't look like very much, but when you put them together, they actually are incredibly significant. So again, here you go. Here's our interior scene, the drinking scene, with the window emplacement here, the window would have looked like this. And uh, on the outside of the wall, you have this scene, which shows the king, a very large scale figure of the king, uh, shooting a bow and arrow from actually from a speeding chariot. You'll see that in a couple of minutes. So um, one, one of the things that Jen developed was documenting the blocks that are very often rep, uh, have representations or carving on multiple sides. She's used Adobe Illustrator to do wonderful isometric drawings like these. Uh, she and Kelly both do this now that allow us to see all the different surfaces of the decorated blocks. And this particular group even has part of the inner thickness of the gate itself. And to show you the context, here we go, the king with the shooting the bow and arrow. This is the entire scene that would have decorated the uh, south tower, the lower part of the south tower of the western gateway, with windows above, name friezes, rebus writings of the king's name. Uh, these are the windows that we were looking at before. Actually, this is the window. Um, and the entire gate, we're now, we now have more of a sense of the basic structure of the gate. And remember, again, this is the stone veneer that was laid against the mud brick core. The mud brick, um, the, the gate itself was primarily mud brick filled with these different rooms. But now we know that the fragmentary material that survives at the site it's not enough to restore the entire gate. We hope that might be, we, we have a little bit of the bottom here. We hope there might be some joining blocks, but there's absolutely nothing. What we have is material from the destroyed upper stories of the tower that seem to have been thrown off first. And then later, the middle sections of the towers were demolished and broken up and reused all over the area. Um, and the debris from the, the reuse, the demolition and reuse covered the blocks from the upper two stories. We even have some of the crenellation stones from the very top. So essentially, if we wanted to restore this gate, it would be floating about 30 feet in the air. Instead, what, we're, what we have decided to do is restore a number of these groups on platforms in an open air museum at the site. So that is our plan now. But of course, everything starts with documentation. And so, um, uh, of course, film photography, digital photography, we're now experimenting with 3D imaging as well as part of our uh, uh, documentation program. And um, this is actually taking us into some very exciting, uh, exciting areas. Uh, Ariel Singer, our epigrapher, has been spearheading the 3D documentation effort. 
Uh, and again, this is very, very new for us, but this is, this is the sort of thing that's perfect for this, this set of material. Um, what, and to back up a bit, what she does is she photographs, and, and some of it is even done with her iPhone, all the different parts of these individual blocks, top, bottom, everything, just circles around, takes dozens of photographs. Um, there is now software, Photoscan Metashape software, that digitally stitches all of these 2D photographs together into a cloud and essentially a 3D image of the, uh, of the, the block itself that is so perfect. It's um, the, 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 the way to put it is orthomosaic photograph. There's absolutely no distortion in this, photo, in this, uh, um, this documentation, which is tremendously useful when you're trying to put things back together again. Um, so the photogrammetry is allowing totally precise measurements um, in our reconstruction of this material. Uh, but the, one of the coolest things about it is that we can now, by recording each of these blocks in a three-dimensional manner, we can virtually reassemble whole wall groups in ways that we would not be able to do physically because of the size of the blocks. So for instance, this group, and, and you'll recognize the, it's again, this, the drinking scene, it's actually part of a much larger group. This is what Ariel has done with the blocks. You can actually rotate the 3D image. Here's the inner thickness of the gate, and then the outer decoration showing the king with his bow and arrow and the plumes of his horses. It could, you could do a complete 360 degree uh, rotation, and now we're back in the inside decoration again. It's fantastic. So over the years, we'll be adding to this block by block by block and be able to do a, a complete reconstruction three-dimensionally virtually. And we hope to also physically put the, the material back together again, or major chunks of it. And uh, we've got this up on the Sketchfab site, and you can access the links to that on the Digital Epigraphy website um, page, web page. Now, again, part of our goal is not only to record the material, put it together virtually, but also put it together physically. And we chose this particular group as a sample for our uh, proposed open air museum. This will be the first group that we've put back together uh, uh, that will grace that open air museum. We wanted to do a sample to show people what was what was ahead for the site. And I should mention that Jen Kempton and Kelly Alberts, they have done all the work on the, the reassembling and the, the analysis of the material that comes together. Now again, the physical reconstruction of the blocks is another collaboration between the epigraphic conservation and stone restoration teams that you can see in action here. They've created a platform for the blocks and are reassembling them. And here is this, this first group that has been finished with Kelly and Jen standing there proudly uh, after it was, uh, 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 the scaffolding was taken down. Um, it's, a, again, a wonderful beginning of something that's going to grow over time. Now, in the course of cataloging and sorting and documenting and analyzing the blocks, uh, a rather extraordinary group was discovered that actually sheds light on um, earlier examples of the Highgate architectural tradition. And this, I've, this is tremendously exciting for me. Um, as an art historian, I'm particularly interested in development, architectural development, but also um, the development of scenes that accompanied these, these uh, architectural examples. Now, in his publication, Excavations of Medina Habu, Volume 4, uh, Holscher published some of the inscribed blocks from the Western High Gate. Again, he didn't have time to do a full analysis, but he published all the cool pieces. And one of them, uh, on the uh, lower right here, was uh, rather a mystery. It shows a figure, a male figure, shooting an arrow with a bow. Um, 
uh, Holscher wasn't sure who this was, assumed might be a prince, and perhaps it was part of a battle scene. Yet the scale was too small for the battle scenes in the Western High Gate blocks, um, and the figure's costume is way too elaborate for a, ba uh, for a battle scene. Now, with the unusual earring, the gold Chevy collar, the elaborate Nubian hunting coiffure with no princely side lock, this figure must be royal, but it has no parallel. And the Chebu collar is, is almost always shown on figures of the king. So um, my assumption is that this is the figure of the king. Now, quite miraculously, a few other blocks have been identified as coming as part of this, uh, coming from part of this group. And one of the ways you can tell is that uh, in this particular group, there was very thick plaster coating on the sandstone before they were actually carved with the scenes. Now, most of that plaster is gone uh, in the additional blocks that have been found. It makes it very hard to see, but they cluster as a group. You can see in the, um, the figure of the, of the king, the head of the king, the plaster and the paint survives. Now, weirdly, this block has disappeared, so we have not been able to actually physically examine it yet. It was, because of its fragile nature, it was probably squirreled away somewhere safe and, and then forgotten. But we're hoping it's going to turn up at some point. Now, in doing the drawings and the analysis of the material, it's becoming very clear what we have here. We have a section of a scene showing the king shooting birds in a garden setting. And when you connect the dots and, and restore the, the elements that are partially preserved in this, this, these blocks, this is what you get. And again, this is very provisional, very preliminary. Um, you, we've got a garden hunting scene, the king shooting birds. They're clearly eating the fruit from his fig trees. I love this particular one. The king is very annoyed and is shooting them with his bow and arrow. Um, he may be accompanied by a female member of his household, one of his daughters or wives. It's a little hard to say. Um, um, you'll see why we have made this restoration later on when I show you some parallel material. The scene is unique in Egyptian art. Uh, in uh, royal iconography or private iconography, we're just not, you're, uh, nothing, no scene like this survives. So this makes it very, very special. But it also may be a link to the decorative program of earlier towers from earlier periods. And that leads me into the second part of this talk, the Epigraphic Survey of Marna Talatat project. I'm going to present here some, uh, some of my ongoing research, new findings, and some unexpected tie-ins with the Medina Tabu High Gates. Now, the background of this is that uh, many of you know that we've been working in Luxor Temple for the last 40 years. Uh, um, not only documenting the reliefs that still stand on the walls, but also the 50,000 block fragments around the temple. We've been documenting those, and we have sponsored a conservation effort there uh, for, for decades where we have raised all of the material off the bare ground, sorted it by category onto damp coursed uh, platforms that we have constructed to protect them. Now we're in the process of documenting them, including uh, photogrammetrically. And again, this is for uh, archives, for reference, for publication. Now, included among the 50,000 fragments are about 5,000 blocks in sandstone from one of Akhenaten's Aten temples at Karnak. And he only used sandstone at Karnak, so they're very easy to identify, and it's very early stylistically. In the analysis of the material in the block yard, I encountered eight talatat in limestone, and Akhenaten never used limestone at Karnak. Also, uh, at Karnak, because it's an early structure, the name of the Aten is always the early form of the name, the living Raharakte. Uh, these blocks are inscribed with the later form of the Aten's name in a much later style, the living Ra. And uh, it's pretty clear that this material 
uh, is not from Karnak, and the textual information on it implies that it actually is from Amarna. And in our eight blocks, one of them has Ramses II decoration on an adjacent side, and we know that he reused a tremendous amount of this material uh, elsewhere in Egypt. So I, much of, almost all of the material from the time of Akhenaten in the Luxor Temple blockyards was brought to Luxor Temple from Karnak in the Middle Ages, where it was quarried from reused positions um, in the Middle Ages and brought for construction purposes around medieval Luxor. So the, I checked in all the magazines and the archives of Karnak and found a handful had been published uh, by Georges Legrain many, many years ago. And again, it's the same thing, a Marna decoration on one side, uh, and then Ramses II decoration on an adjacent side. But then I checked the Pennsylvania magazine at Karnak that uh, houses, uh, I think it was over 17,000 blocks, primarily um, from Akhenaten's early Aten complex at Karnak. And I had seen in my, just when I was doing dissertation research there a long time ago, I'd seen some limestone blocks. The American Research Center in Egypt, um, uh, uh, about 10 years ago, um, completely developed the uh, magazine. They cleaned the rows, they restacked, they did photography. In fact, um, one of our photographers, Owen Murray, was, was one of the photographers who recorded all the material. So I asked them if I could have access to whatever limestone block material they had. And to my intense surprise, they had uh, photography of over 130 blocks um, Ramsey's second decoration on one side, Amarna decoration on the other, and the texts make it very clear that this material all came from Amarna, that Ramses II seems to have shipped a whole load of blocks from Amarna for uh, his reuse in another structure at Karnak. And providentially, there was so much Ramses II decoration preserved on the blocks I've been able to restore an entire wall from his structure made of this Amarna material. And this is a pre preliminary mosaic of it here that was put together um, by uh, Owen Murray for me. So, and it's actually inscribed on the other side as well. This is an exterior wall section showing an offering scene. There are reliefs on the inside as well. So this is a, a little micro project that's actually quite fun. I am much more interested in the Amarna inscriptions, the Amarna sides of the blocks. And so, again, by way of background, all of, this, all of the stone material from Amarna comes from primarily the temple complexes. And this is a fantastic model that's in the visitor's center at Amarna now that Barry Kemp, uh, had, uh, director of the Amarna project, has put together. Um, but it gives us a very good overview of the central city, the Great Aten Temple in the upper left, which had literally kilometers of inscribed wall surfaces, the Great Palace here, King's House attached to it, the small Aten Temple also made of stone. So again, most of the, most of the um, uh, stone material quarried from Amarna does come from the temple complexes, although there are indications that parts of the palaces were made of stone as well, which is very unusual. Um, now, except for Karnak, which was taken down almost immediately after Akhenaten's death, and uh, particularly most of it mostly during the reign of Horemheb, uh, the, uh, it squirreled away in his later pylons, the Aten temples in Egypt and Nubia survived into the Ramesid period. They remained standing, and it appears they were functioning at least through the reign of Seti I. Now, Ramses II demolished the stone structures at Amarna, finally, and recycled the Taltat blocks in a series of new temple constructions, his new temple constructions, all over Middle and Upper Egypt. So you find material from Amarna reused by Ramses II just to the north of Amarna at Sheikh Abada in his temple there, and south of Amarna in Asiut, Matmar, Abidus, Luxor, all the way south to Armont, which is south of Luxor. 
Of course, you have to remember he had enormous amounts of material to reuse uh, from Amarna. The temple complexes there were absolutely enormous. Um, so, of course, he couldn't simply reuse it all in one place. Now, the best known site for reused halotype, particularly from the time of Ramses II, is uh, Hermopolis, where um, Horemheb and Ramses II, in particular, reused material from Amarna in the great temple of the god Thoth at Hermopolis. Now, it turns out that Horemheb reused material in a pylon that fronted the Thoth temple. Um, and the British Museum conducted excavations in the very destroyed and mostly quarried away ruins of the uh, pylon. And it's clear from the, the few inscribed blocks that they found that the blocks that Horemheb reused came from palaces at Amarna, not from the temples. In fact, weirdly, Horemheb actually added monuments to the great Aten temple, including a stela and a limestone sphinx, and fragments of both were found by the early excavators there, the Egypt Exploration Society. This is the base of the sphinx. The archaeological evidence at the site that Barry Kemp has, has actually commented on suggests that the Aten cult continued at Amarna for some time after Akhenaten's death, and we know that the Aten Temple at, at um, uh, Memphis, for instance, uh, continued at least through the reign of Seti I. So th that's uh, a very interesting uh, thing that uh, many people don't know, that the Aten cult actually continued long after Akhenaten's death. Now, over 1,500 talatat from Amarna reused by Ramses II were recovered in the foundations of his Thoth Temple pylons at Hermopolis by a German expedition from Hildesheim, working between 1929 and 1939. Uh, this was uh, headed by Gunter Roder of the Romer Pelizaeus Museum in Hildesheim. And God bless him, he documented everything and published. Um, he didn't live long enough to see his publication of this material, but his, his student and colleague Reiner Honka finished it and published more in another publication in the late 70s. Now, most of the material, uh, most of the Talatat material from Hermopolis was excavated by Roder, but during World War II, when the mission had, was obliged to leave, the locals continued to pull up material because of its beauty, and they, they uh, uh, sold it. So, the end result is that quite a bit of material, uh, which originally was in private collections sold during World War II or just afterward, uh, were, have been donated to museums all over the world. And there's quite a bit of this material, uh, hundreds and hundreds of blocks that are, that, uh, are accessible and protected in, uh, uh, as I said, museums all over the world, Boston, New York, Munich, um, the Louvre, e absolutely everywhere. And the material has a tremendous amount to teach us about Akhenaten and his city to the Aten. Now, the presence of Amarna Talatat and the Luxor Temple blockyards required a thorough review of the published sources, which is what I did to try to understand their context. And one unexpected, unexpected result was that some of the inscribed block material from Amarna parallels and anticipates the interior decorative, decorative programs of the Medina Tabu High Gates. And I found this tremendously interesting. So I'm going to present a few case studies here, a few groups that appear to be from domestic scenes, palace scenes, as opposed to temple scenes. This is one of my favorites. It's a drinking group. And um, essentially, it is, it's, it, it is a duplicate of a scene found complete in the tomb of Mary Ra II, uh, uh, one of the private tombs at Amarna, one of the north tomb, tomb groups, which shows Nefertiti here straining uh, a drink uh, through a strainer, probably wine, for her husband accompanied by uh, their daughters. Here you have a female figure who is doing exactly the same thing. Uh, accompanied by royal children. And you can see we've got three blocks here. 
This one published by Rotor, this one in a private collection in France, this one in San Antonio, Texas. They all join. You've got the feet of the individuals involved, including the larger female. Um, I'm not entirely sure what her identity is. And this particular block is uh, one of my favorites. It's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, showing probably two princesses, although it may be a princess and a nurse because the full frontal position of the female figure is very unusual, and usually you only see that with servants. But this is a Marna, so it could possibly be another princess. Uh, from the elaborate headdress, one would almost expect that. But this is, this is a, an intimate domestic scene. It's a drinking scene. There are feasting scenes as well. And what that does is it parallels uh, the the uh, drinking scene that has been the focus of, of this talk uh, a few minutes ago, which shows, again, the king relaxing with a drink with his family. And the next case, case study two, these were a series of blocks showing life-size figures that were very, a little hard to understand, uh, but I love, I love brain teasers like this. And this particular block in particular, I found really fascinating, and I just couldn't stop looking at it until I'd figured it out. But I mean, it's very unusual. You have a female figure here, beautiful um, uh, depictions of her hair. Here's her chin, lips, very destroyed, of course, arm. The hair is gathered back, and the length of the hair is very typical of royal nurses at Amarna, who are a, a very strong presence in the scenes showing the royal family. They're all, they always accompany the royal children. And so you have the nurse with her head at this level, but here is very clearly the heel and sandal of a foot and some sort of stairway. So how, what on earth, what is happening when you've got a foot and a head at the same level? I was intrigued. So I did some experimental sketches and came up with a reconstruction here of what the scene must have possibly looked like. Now, what this reminded me of instantly was a scene in an ostracon from Daryl Medina from the early Ramesid period. From, this may be from the time of Ramses II, actually, which shows a small servant washing the feet of her mistress, who is, this is a, a, a childbirth scene, the, the, the child is suckling. Um, but it's the, it's the only scene that I know of that shows a figure having the, the feet washed like this, and it may very well be that this is what the nurse is doing. Um, there are any number of other possibilities. There is a block in, from Asiut that was accompanied by blocks inscribed for uh, uh, the Kamal Nana complex at Amarna that shows similar royal nurses kissing the hand of a royal figure. This is an extraordinary physical proximity to the royal family. And if you've got a scene like this here, it could very well be that the nurse is actually kissing the foot of her mistress or master uh, in this particular scene. The stairway is a very important clue as to the context of this scene. And what this indicates is the stairway is very often accompanying bed scenes. And this is a scene from an Egyptian, from a painted uh, uh, wall in a, a Theban tomb that shows the um, lion-footed bed uh, with the bed stair here, because sometimes these beds were rather high. And what you have is the three of those blocks in that group actually join. You have the rear section of a royal figure seated on a very plump mattress on a bed that's approached by a bed stair. And I originally thought, well, maybe the, the proportions were proper, maybe this block and these blocks actually related. And then I realized that they're actually inscribed on the other side with a scene showing 
um, ladies in waiting. So it's very clear this this group actually does relate. This is these two blocks are these blocks are from the same scene. So what we have here is a life-size royal ladies palace bedroom scene. This is not from a temple. This is probably from a palace, uh, from a stone increment of uh, a mud brick palace. And we'll, we'll get into what this stone element might have been. Now, the really exciting thing that um, uh, came up in the course of my research, uh, Barry Kemp very kindly gave me uh, some uh, unpublished uh, drawings of some fragments that were excavated from the site of the North Palace at Amarna back in 1923-1924. And this particular block is from an identically scaled bedroom scene. This can only be the front leg of a bed because it's much, much too large for a similar uh, footed um, throne or chair. The, this is the sort of thing you would find under a bed. This is a scented fat that's been decorated with um, a fl little floral collar and flowers. There are probably more of those here. Um, the exciting possibility is that this group of blocks quarried from Amarna and reused at Hermopolis, and this block might come from the same place. So one, pot, one model that I'm following is that this group, this bedroom scene, could very well be from uh, the a stone uh, a part of the palace, of the, of the North Palace at Amarna. So what this is telling us is that there were life-size bedroom scenes that decorated chambers that were probably bedchambers. Now, in the high gates at Medina Habu, there are no bedchamber scenes, um, but one has to remember that the primary residential area in the high gates would have been the mud brick wings. So it's quite possible that there were depictions of bedrooms uh, that were painted on the mud brick walls, but they're simply, they simply do not survive. We do have parallels from the Ramesid period. Again, Ostraca from Daryl Medina, done by painters and artists who were actually uh, executing these scenes elsewhere um, have, actually, have left us these wonderful paintings showing bedroom scenes, again, with an emphasis on childbirth uh, and um, uh, suckling. But they are very, very reminiscent of the, what's going on in the bedroom scenes that is slowly coming together from Amarna. So we know that there are bedroom scenes being painted in the Ramesid period as well, and the west, the uh, uh, high gates at Medina and Habu probably had such scenes. Now my third case study, this fantastic block from Amarna, um, it shows essentially this has to be a figure of Nefertiti because only Akhenaten and Nefertiti have uh, cartouches of the Aten uh, on their bodies, on their chests and their arms, uh, because this, this uh, figure is clearly female. This has to be Nefertiti. She's probably wearing the high conical flat-topped uh, cap crown, and uh, Akhenaten's arm is around her like this. This is his back. It's a fantastically intimate scene, and it is absolutely duplicated in the eastern high gate right here, where you have Ramses III with his arm around one of the female members of his household, um, either daughter, concubine, girlfriend, hard to say, but wonderful relaxed intimacy uh, while he's playing drafts with uh, another member of the household. Now, one, again, might assume that such displays of affection are an Amarna artistic innovation that survived into the Ramesid period. But we would be wrong because one of the things that one learns when one gets into Amarna art is that it is very often grounded in much earlier artistic traditions. This particular uh, scene is, uh, and again, you can see it's absolutely identical to what's going on here. 
This is from Dynasty 11 from Daryl Bahri. It showed King Mentehotep II and one of his wives named Kemset from her funerary chapel. Uh, so it shows us that you have to be extremely careful when you uh, assume that something is invented, invented at Amarna. You have to check very carefully because very often there are antecedents that are simply being reinterpreted at Amarna. Uh, and again, here is the, the Ramses III scene from the Eastern High Gate. So this is something that I just love about Egyptian art. Now, the last case study I'm going to discuss is also one of the most fascinating. And this is one of my favorite relief fragments from all of ancient Egyptian history. Um, it is so enigmatic, but it is, as I say, it's the poster child of the entire Amarna period. It's this sort of languid, indolent uh, hand gesturing toward a pile of food or offerings. You know, it just typifies our, our sort of exotic ideas of the Amarna period as being an indolent, luxurious court uh, where people can just barely have strength enough to reach for the next piece of food. Anyway, there's been a tremendous amount of speculation about what's going on with this particular um, um, relief. And I remember there's something about it that I had seen before. I, it's an unusual gesture. You, it just doesn't occur in Egyptian art, but I thought I'd remembered somewhere where it had to have occurred. And then I finally remembered it was in the small golden shrine from Tutankhamun's tomb that shows Tutankhamun and his wife, Anxanamun, one of the daughters of, of Akhenaten and Nefertiti, in a swamp scene. And she has exactly the same gesture. She's pointing, just as our figure is pointing, not reaching, but pointing. So she's pointing toward the marshes. And here is the entire scene. The king is seated, shooting um, waterfowl in the marsh setting. Anxanamun is handing him an arrow as he shoots the birds one after the other. It's a fantastic scene, just absolutely lovely. And our block, it turns out, the mystery elements here, instead of a drop of fat or a piece of food or something, this is actually an arrow tip which has pierced the body probably of a duck. And we've got papyrus umbels here. It's actually, this appears to be part of a swamp setting. Now, another miracle happened. It turns out that a block published by Roeder that he found at Hermopolis seems to join this block. And you can tell because you've got a raised inscription here that carries over into the larger block. You have more papyrus here. You've got more arrows. This is the, the, um, the base of an arrow. And then you've got fly, a flying duck here who's probably in the process of being shot. And um, in the analysis, early analysis of this block, it was assumed this was a papyrus stock but it is probably the bow of the king of Akhenaten who is uh, shooting ducks in this marsh setting. I was able to find a number of other blocks from the scene, and this is a very provisional reconstruction of the group. So here we have the female figure pointing toward the marshes, Akhenaten, the king, shooting the waterfowl. There are probably many more flying up here. I've got more of his bow. I know he's seated because there's part of a throne here. Um, this all lines up. Quite a bit missing, but it's a, a, clearly it's, it's easily reconstructable. The female figure has had her head recarved and the text erased, uh, which the traces actually show the name of Kia, who was the non-royal second wife of Akhenaten, about whom we know very, very little. And I would love to explore the relationship of Kia and Nefertiti and Akhenaten and Amarna uh, in the late Amarna period, but that's another lecture altogether, so we're going to have to wait on that one. But I will raise a question here. Is this scene another Amarna artistic innovation? Clearly, 
It predates the Tutankhamun scenes. It's a life-size scene that Tutankhamun's artists clearly copied. But is this unique to Amarna? Was this invented at Amarna? And the answer is no. We would be wrong to assume so, because it turns out uh, recently, a relief was uncovered in Abu Sir from the time of Sahara in Dynasty 5, more than a thousand years before Akhenaten, which showed scenes of him fouling in the marshes with his wife. And here he's pulling the rope that led to a clap net to capture waterfowl. Look what his wife is doing. She is pointing toward the marshes in exactly or very similar way that Kia is pointing toward the marshes here. So this is a genre scene that had antecedents centuries before the Amarna period, and yet is significant, significant enough for, to Akhenaten to, um, uh, to take its place among the, uh, the decoration in probably one of his palaces. So I love, again, these long traditions that continue and evolve through time. So after the time of Akhenaten, Tutankhamun's artists are clearly copying these larger scaled reliefs. They're hunting and fishing scenes. I have many uh, blocks coming together that show uh, various scenes of this sort. But the, the question remains, what is the architectural context of the life-size Amarna scenes that are on these stone walls? Because again, um, Egyptian palaces, royal palaces, are traditionally always mud brick. There is a major clue in a relief from the time of Horemheb, or the time of Tutankhamun. Um, before Horemheb became king, he served under Tutankhamun uh, in a military way and was his commander-in-chief and generalissimo. And he started a tomb at Saqqara. He was private. He had no intention of ever ruling Egypt. Um, and his tomb is one of the most elaborate and, and richly decorated in the Saqqara necropolis from this, from this period. Now, when Jeffrey Martin excavated the tomb of Hormeb at Saqqara, he found reliefs that went this far showing a window of appearance scene, and it, it clearly is the palace of Tutankhamun at Memphis. Jeffrey realized the block in the Oriental Institute Museum actually joined the scene, so the drawing shows that fragment in the OI Museum joined here. And then Zahi Hawass found three other blocks um, quite a bit later, that I realized must also join this scene. So this, they actually, it's four pieces of a slab that was broken up and reused elsewhere. Breasted actually purchased this fragment, I think in the in 1920s, uh, where it entered the OI Museum, and um, these three fragments were published by, by Zahi. And um, t together he and I have published the entire wall group. What this shows is a window of appearance in the palace flanked by decorated window jams that show the king in these hunting poses. Here he's actually shooting arrows through ingots, but the other scenes appear to be probably hunting scenes. The architectural context is a we've got a platform, the window of appearance is on a platform, the doorway may imply that, there, that the window was over uh, uh, an entryway of some sort. This may provide the architectural context of our blocks. Another clue that we have is from the North Riverside Palace at Amarna. This was the official residence of Akhenaten, Nefertiti, and their children. It was built of mud brick with a mud brick high gate entryway. And you can see here that the palace itself, of which most of it is in the cultivation now, was surrounded by a double enclosure wall that was buttressed. There were magazines here, the main, just a corner of the main palace here, which must have been quite extensive. But the gate itself takes a very familiar form. It's interpreted in mud brick, but it is very similar to what we have in Medinat Habu. And this seems to be the architectural 
context, or at least an embryonic high gate here. So all palaces at Amarna are made of mud brick, clearly including the enclosure walls and even the entrance gateway. So where and what were the stone elements? Well, the answer is to be found in the North Palace at Amarna, which is also made of mud brick, but it preserves the foundations of a stone central tower. Now, this palace is intact. It was excavated in the 19, 1920, 1923, 1924, uh, but also later on in the late 90s by um, Barry Kemp and uh, uh, archaeologist Kate Spence. And this was originally built as the residence for the greatly beloved second wife of Akhenaten, Kia. The North Palace featured a stone tower between the first and the second courts right here. Evidence, and this is evidenced by a stone foundation emplacement, stone and mortar. There were impressions in the mortar, in the concrete of the stone blocks that originally formed the foundation. Now, why would you have a stone foundation here? Stone, the answer to that is that stone allowed structural support for multiple stories. There was something, there was a uh, tower that was necessary in this spot that required some additional structural support. So this tower, flanked by two mud brick pylons, actually marked the front of the palace complex proper, which is right here. This is a, a ritual area. And <clears throat> the stone foundations could have supported between two and three stories, possibly even more. Now, the North Riverside Palace of Akhenaten and Nefertiti appears to have had a similar larger stone high gate, evidenced by the stone blocks that we have from it, that was probably just behind the mud brick entryway. So it would have taken a very similar form to the mud brick entryway here, but been considerably taller and built of stone. So my proposed decoration for the window jams of the North Palace Stone Central Tower are two hunting scene vignettes that I have put together that show Kia accompanying Akhenaten. North Palace, that was the residence of Kia. Um, there were probably similar scenes showing Akhenaten and Nefertiti in their own residential palace, uh, just to the north of the North Palace. So this is what you can imagine the North Palace entry tower would have looked like, but imagine perhaps another story. And the window, um, the window openings would have been flanked with stone carved scenes on either side, um, showing the king hunting very, very much like the Memphis Palace of Tutankhamun was decorated with similar jams showing the king in this, in this uh, uh, shooting or this hunting pose. Now, the bird hunting scene from the destroyed Western High Gate at Medina Tabu suggests that the Medina Tabu high gates and the stone towers of the Amarna palaces are part of the same architectural tradition. And you can see it very clearly. The architectural form of the mud brick um, uh, gateway with the, the um, uh, windows above is very, very similar, totally embryonic version of what we later had at Medina Tabu in stone and much larger in scale. And if we've got shooting scenes that are accompanying the windows at, at, of these towers at Amarna, it is very interesting that we have a shooting scene uh, found in the remains of the stone elements of the Western High Gate Tower. So it does look like we have similar iconography, similar scenes, associated with the similar architecture from both complexes. Now, this has significant implications for understanding the Medina Tabu Mortuary Temple complex expansion that happened late in Ramses III's reign that included the addition of the East and West High Gates. We have to remember that Ramses III expanded his mortuary temple precinct around the time of his first jubilee in his year 30. 
The king's primary, primary residences were in the Delta and Memphis. He did not live in the South. He lived in the North. We know from official records that two years after his jubilee in year 32, Ramses III traveled to Thebes with the royal household for a 20-day festive celebration. It was probably a continuation of the jubilee celebration. Now, the common assumption has been that the massive mud brick walls pierced by the 20 meter high sandstone high gates were built as a defensive fortification to protect the holy precinct and the king in a time of growing unrest, particularly against marauding hordes of Libyans. The defensive towers would have been utilized as a convenient, safe residence for the king and his household, but were built to be functionally defensive. But even Uvo Holscher remarked that the fortifications of Medina Tabu struck him as being somewhat artificial. Other elements of Ramses III's Medina Tabu expansion included gardens, pools, and also dozens and dozens of dormitory rooms ranged around the inside of the new walls for the enormous staff that the king was bringing with him. It now seems more likely that the high gates and massive enclosure walls of Medina Tabu represent the standard architecture of a royal residence, symbolically represented as a fortress. Residential palace architecture, even at Amarna, reflected the early fortified nature of royal residences from the beginning of Egyptian history when defenses were necessary. But was more of a stage set by the Ramesid period. The new data from Medina Tabu and Amarna is helping us to understand the iconographic vocabulary of the royal residence architectural tradition in Egypt. My conclusion is that Ramesses III did not fortify his mortuary temple as we have long assumed. Rather, he enclosed his temple within an enormous royal residence palace specially built for his festive visit to Thebes in his year 32. He didn't have a palace in Thebes, and so he built one around his mortuary temple. As a postscript, I can't close without mentioning the harem conspiracy. Now, Ramses III's joy in his enormous new residence in western Thebes was short-lived. Court records indicate that a conspiracy organized by one of his Theban wives, a son, and a group of high officials resulted in an assassination attempt on the king in an upper floor of one of the Medina Tabu high gates, possibly our western high gate. The court documents do not reveal whether the attempt was successful or not, but CT scans of Ramses III's mummy in 2005 by radiologist Sahar Salim and Zahi Hawaz, indicated that the king had suffered multiple stab wounds and a slit throat. There is no question that the assassination attempt succeeded. Thus, the great king met his end in a magnificent setting that was supposed to celebrate and perpetuate his glorious life. But that is the subject of yet another lecture. Thank you very much for your attention and special thanks to the staff of the Epigraphic Survey, the Oriental Institute, University of Chicago, USAID Egypt, and especially the Ministry of Tourism Antiquities and the Supreme Council of Antiquities with whom we work in very, very fruitful partnership. If you're interested in more, in more information about our activities, because this is just one, one project among many that we are sponsoring in Luxor. Uh, check out our websites, check out Digital Epigraphy website, and the social media platforms of the Oriental Institute. Thank you very, very much. Stay safe and stay healthy. For over 100 years, the OI has been a leading research center for the study of ancient Middle Eastern civilizations. Join us in uncovering the past and learn about the beginnings of our lives as humans together. Become a member by visiting oi.uchicago.edu slash member.